Hello, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland, where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. I'm Kasav Kasana, a senior at Solon High School and the Community Outreach Coordinator of the City Club of Cleveland's Youth Forum Council. It's October 14th today, and you're with us for a virtual City Club Youth Forum featuring a conversation on youth involvement in politics. As we head into one of the most consequential elections in American history, it's important to note the unique impact that youth have in politics. However, as a nation with one of the lowest rates of youth voter turnout in the world, it's important to discuss this issue and how to bridge this disparity. Studies have shown closing the gap could be made possible by simplifying the means by which eligible people can vote or even automatic voter registration. Potentially lowering the voting age is also a possible solution getting national traction with the goal to lead to an increase in interest in politics for America's upcoming generation. Joining us today to discuss this are Dr. Lauren Copland, Associate Director of the Community Research Institute and Assistant Professor of Political Science at Baldwin Wallace University. Representative Stephanie D. House, Representative for Ohio's 11th District, and Isaac Mitchell, the host of the Youth Vote podcast and a local political campaign manager. As in every City Club forum, you can participate with your questions. Text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them at City Club Youth. We'll work them in. Here to guide our discussion is Youth Forum Council member Kennedy Smith, a senior at Hawkins School. I turn the forum over to you, Kennedy. Thank you, Kasav, and welcome to all the panelists. I'd just like to start off the panel by talking about the current state of politics right now, especially with the election. So as you all know, early voting has opened in Ohio as of Tuesday, and across the US, millions of people have already voted. Do you expect to see the same turnout for our younger voters? I'll jump in. I I think we'll see higher voter turnout overall this year, but I'm not sure about turnout among youth because there isn't the excitement about the two major party candidates. And I think that perhaps there might be an enthusiasm gap between the younger voting demographic and the older voting demographic. So for example, my students were way more excited about Sanders' candidacy than they are about Biden's candidacy. Oh, sorry, Representative House. <laughs> so, uh, I, I agree with that. Um, I think that we're not gonna really see a particularly exciting amount of young people showing up to vote, which makes me sad, but it's the reality of the situation. And um, Dr. Copeland made a good point, which is that a big part of that is because of this enthusiasm gap where like when I talk to young people who are involved in politics, I rarely hear them excited about Joe Biden. And I even more rarely hear them excited about Donald Trump. So it seems like due to the candidates that uh, we were offered, um, a lot of young people won't show up. The one other thing I wanted to add to that though, is just that I think if we see a higher amount of young people show up to vote than maybe we usually see in a presidential year, it might be um, because of these Senate races that are really exciting. Um, and it might be because of some of these down ballot races that are really exciting, even going as local as city council and mayoral races. I see a lot of young people getting out and volunteering for those. Um, and then obviously they might kind of vote up the ticket because they're showing up to vote for their mayor and then they'll also vote kind of up the ticket. So I'm, I'm hoping that that happens, but yeah, I don't, I don't see a lot of young people excited this year. I, I guess I would add, I always wanna be an optimist and uh, the students in my classes at least, and they're not reflective of youth in general because they're political science majors, so they're all gonna vote, but they are really down about the 
the hate that comes out of the Trump campaign and the division, uh, we tend to see younger people having more liberal views on social issues, especially things like climate change. Um, there's also been youth activism with uh, gun reform movements. And so there might be this decision to turn out to sort of shift the public conversation away from divisiveness and towards unity. And that's certainly what Biden and Harris are campaigning on. Well, I will agree with uh, Dr. Copeland and Isaac about um, youth participation not being as high um, you know, comparatively, uh, if there is even an increase. And I think that that can be, that's yet to be seen um, when we come to voter turnout. Um, what I do think though, um, I don't think it's necessarily based on enthusiasm. I really think it's really based on the how or the lack of engagement and education that we do in America um, to our citizens. That's the real word. That is why young people, young people really aren't too far off from their parents and their grandparents. Our young people are a reflection of us and because we as older you know models are not demonstrating and are actively engaged because we don't know how i think that really has led to the disconnect between our young people um and if i could just say one more thing on that as well uh i spoke uh not to keep plugging my podcast but it's going to just happen organically i spoke with a woman who is going to college in muncie indiana at ball state um, however, she lives in Missouri uh, initially, and she was explaining to me how in 2018 she tried to vote absentee. She went through all the steps. She got her ballot. She filled it out. She submitted it. And then after the election, she got an email that said, actually, your vote wasn't counted because you didn't get your ballot notarized. Um, I then, through the podcast, spoke with many different um, activists, voting rights activists and professors and other young people who had similar experiences and found that there are probably thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of young people who are disenfranchised just because they go to school or because they don't uh, work in an environment in which they can get the day off to go to work. So I guess that's something um, like Representative House said, like it's not necessarily just about the uh, enthusiasm. It also has to do with this idea of the system is not set up to be easy to participate in in the first place. So. I think a lot of well-intentioned young people are not going to have their votes counted in 2020 because of these unfortunate realities of our system. And um, yeah, Mr. Mitchell, in addition to that, we found in research that we we're doing, um, according to 538 by Nate Silver, a record number of ballots are going to be mailed in this year. However, people of color and younger voters, as you were saying, tend to have their ballots tossed at a greater weight rate than older and white voters. In fact, voters younger than 21 are eight times more likely to have their ballot tossed than those 65 and older. What do you think this gap is here and how do you think it can be mitigated? This is a huge problem. We're gonna see a massive problem this year with naked ballots, um, even, here in Ohio, the discussion really centers a lot on Pennsylvania, but if you don't place your ballot in an envelope and fill out that envelope and then put that envelope in another envelope and make sure you have two stamps on it because it's 70 cents to mail and not 50 cents, um, then your vote won't be counted. Now, of course, you can include your phone number and email address on these ballots that you send in and allegedly the board will contact you if they receive your vote and the inner envelope is not there. But with the record number of mail-in ballots going into these election boards, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to get back to you in time for you to get down there and cast a provisional ballot. So I think the complexity of the voting process makes it exceedingly difficult for people who haven't voted by mail before to get their votes counted. And that's really concerning for our democracy and democratic lowercase d politics. 
So I will say for this, this is the reason why um, I would say those within the Democratic Party have been focusing on having a voter plan. You know, while everybody has their own, they can vote individually, one man, woman, child vote, right? Voting is actually a group activity. You see what I'm saying? Voting is about showing influence. And so one of the things that I will offer as encouragement to people, if this is your first time voting by mail, you're not the only one. We have a, you know, a, a, a like four weeks here in Ohio to vote early, right? So this means people can actually get together. Like, don't like, you know, I think this is one of the things that we have to break down this this illusion that you know let's keep it secret don't talk about it no you need to talk about it you absolutely need to talk about who you're thinking about voting or you don't know i was sharing um i was uh at the first uh um debate there was a, a watch party and i was trying to engage uh, like um a couple of these were older adults about stop voting alone you know what I'm saying? Most people they get their ballots, they don't know who's on there. I mean, um, they this particular person, the ballot was four pages long. There were about twelve different competitive races on their ballot, and I was saying my suggestion would at least get five other people, right? So you get this group of people, you get this group of people, you get the presidential candidates, you get you know these two countywide. Um, uh, 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 judges, you take um, the Supreme Court races, you take this legislative race, and everybody go and do the work on the different candidates and come back and convene and talk about it. And then people can be informed to make a decision. Then we can be like, okay, y'all, let's stop and read. And I would say one of the things happens in our society, many of us don't read. We don't follow directions. This is a fact. I'm not, I'm just not making it up. This is not just young people. A lot of us do not stop read and follow directions. It's just like cooking. Cooking is the same thing. People can't cook because they can't follow directions. So this is the thing I'm telling you, do not do this before. Do not vote alone. I am, do not vote alone. This is a team activity. It is about trying to have influence. People that of like minds coming together to talk about these are the issues that we care about and these are the people that we want to put in office to carry our water to carry our message. So this is what I want to say. Do not be discouraged. Voting by mail, early voting is a good thing. It is a good thing, right? And we have systems in place to help people along. In Ohio, and I would say even in Cuyahoga County, you can track your ballot. I still have not received my ballot. I Mind you, I submitted my application on September 28th, but I've been following along. You see what I'm saying? Because it's still giving me time to fix corrections. I put in my mother's application. They lost her application. It's okay. You see what I'm saying? We got to build people's confidence that if there are mistakes, because we are still dealing with people and people do make mistakes, but we still have time to get it right. So I want to encourage you, do not vote alone, have a voting plan and make sure y'all can come together to have influence in this democracy because it's our democracy. Yeah, there, there's definitely, there's at least three points there. Is One is that voting can be fun, <laughs> at least according to people like us, um, when you make it more of a, a social activity. And we know that social influence plays a really important role in getting people out to vote. So people are far more likely to vote if their friend asks them to. And so one of the things that helps us in this respect is social media. So if you post up there, I voted, what's your voting plan? Do you need help with your ballot? I think that's really useful. Um, another point is that if something happens with your ballot, it doesn't show up, for example, you can always go cast a provisional ballot on the day of the election as a last resource if you don't get that mail or that absentee ballot in time. Um, but the third thing and which complicates this a little bit is the pandemic. So normally we think of getting together and voting together in terms of being together physically, but we're not able to do that as much really this year. And so that's just another glitch that makes it a little bit more difficult to make this a social act. 
Um, if I could just say one more thing on that too, I, I love the way representative house that you put it of this idea of like, we have to kind of compel each other to vote and kind of divvying up the candidates. Cause I know I live in um, Hamilton County in Cincinnati. So my ballot came with all these competitive judge races and it's a lot of research to do. Those <laughs> judge races are where you have to take time. Um, I wanted to add one thing, which is that I actually um, in 2019, I was the, I helped manage a campaign for city council in North Royalton, Ohio, which is in Cuyahoga County. And my candidate was a 19 year old, um, a fairly progressive Democrat running against a more establishment uh, member of the council. He lost by three votes. And the reason I tell that story is because I speak to a lot of young people who specifically say my vote's not gonna matter. And I think that that, that idea still perpetuates, and I'm sure it's not just exclusively a young person problem, but I know that um, many people are tricked into this idea that their vote doesn't matter. And that's pretty much not true um, across the board. So obviously when we're talking about the presidential election, it's easy to feel really small, but there are city council races, prosecutor races, judge races, people who have big, big influence over your local communities where the votes are going to be literally down to less than 10 votes that determine this race. So your your vote really, really matters, especially the further down that ballot you start looking. And I just wanted to kind of tack that on that, um, like Representative House and um, Dr. Copeland said, if you can get those five extra people to vote, then you might have just determined the outcome of an entire election. Right. Those lower ballot or down ballot races are often decided by one vote or under 10 votes, exactly like you said. And one of the things I'm asking my students to do is to text five of their friends and say, hey, I voted. Did you vote already? Do you need any help? Um, in an effort not only to have some social pressure put on them, but also to let them know that there's people out there who can help them if they feel overwhelmed by the process. Uh, there's so many people out there who are willing to help and know how to navigate the process. And I think we need to let people know that it's okay to ask for help if you need to navigate this process for the first time. And, um you know, around the topic of just how important it is to make sure that, you know, we all vote, especially encouraging more of our friends as youth to vote. And um, it brings us to the, like, the big question we've got, and it's how can we as young people, especially those young people who can't vote, be involved in this election? Like, for example, I'm 17, I missed the election date by like a month. And so, you know, I have been encouraging my friends to vote and like voting plans but I'm not necessarily sure how I can actually be involved and have an impact. So I think what a good thing to come out of this pandemic has been more innovative ways and an emphasis on more innovative ways to mobilize voters and get out the vote. And I know that at least the, the Democratic Party allows you to text uh, possible supporters by phone and ask them who you're going to vote for or do you have a voting plan? Do you need more information? Would you like to put up a yard sign? So you can uh, text people through by getting lists from the parties in both the state and uh, the national election. And then um, other things you can do are display political messages like bumper stickers, uh, which are kind of outdated, I guess, but yard signs also on social media, on Snapchat, on Twitter, on Facebook. You can um, voice your political support for or against a candidate there. Or you can just put up something more generic like vote 2020 or post voter registration deadlines, or you must don't assume that October 31st in Ohio is the day you should mail your ballot, even though that's the deadline. That's the worst thing you could do because it might not get there in time. So perhaps tell people to make the deadline for themselves a week earlier, like October 21st. Those might be a few ways that you could get involved. You could also volunteer. You could phone bank. You could knock doors. So there's a lot of other things you can do 
to get people involved other than just voting in the election. Um, to add on to that a little bit, I, I think that uh, your example of you being 17 and not being able to vote is relatable. I remember um, wanting to vote in my first election in 2015. I was just too young and I couldn't do it. And so then uh, it's just a frustrating thing whenever you're like, if, if I could have like <laughs> waited in the womb for one more month, then I'd be able to participate in this. Um, so I think that uh, getting friends to vote is a way that you can kind of vote in a way. So if you know people who are 18 or 19 and they're not particularly interested in politics, but you can compel them to go out and vote, then in a way you're voting, right? Because those are votes that were not going to be cast unless you got involved. So as a, you know, even younger than 17, as a 15, 16, 17 year old, you can get a lot more votes. So I like to joke sometimes, I'm kind of the political one in my family. And I like to joke, I get three or four votes every election because I have a couple family members and friends who reach out and say, Isaac, who should I vote for? And so you, even though you're not 18 yet, you can still vote. The other thing I wanted to say is uh, campaigning is one of the most fun, engaging, and unique ways you can participate in our democracy. And so I think that if you reach out to local candidates, and I'm big on local races, I think, again, obviously the presidential stuff is incredibly important and we have to vote there and people should donate and spend some time there. But I think if you can reach out to your local state representative candidate, if you can reach out to local city council or county commissioner or prosecutor or judge candidates, those are those races that are going to significantly impact people's lives and that you can have a lot more sway in, even if you're not old enough to vote. So I know COVID times make it hard to do campaigning because we can't do the traditional door to door uh, knocking that we like to do, but you can still do lit drops, which is walking around and dropping off literature at people's doors. You can do phone banking, text banking. I could go on and on about this forever, but I really think Google who are your local candidates and then just reach out to them. A lot of times, uh, last thing I'll say, a lot of times is that uh, you can find them on Twitter and just DM them and say, hey, I live in the same city as you. I would like to vote for you, but I'm 17. Uh, how can I help? And I've never met a campaign or a candidate that will say no to that offer in my entire life. And I would say added on to what I said and I and Dr. Copeland um, indicated uh, as far as participating. So I think this is, could be a wonderful activity for um, those 17 year olds like yourself, Kennedy and or younger um, as I talked about the info, there's so much information Isaac was talking about the judges. This could be one of those things where there's a group of young people that will research some candidates, you know, offer some, I would say, quick blurbs, you know, to help family and friends have be more secure. And like, at least I know something about the candidates so that they can make some informed decisions. Um, I, I would offer, I can guarantee you, if you do that and pass it on to several people in your network, they will be more likely to vote than not because they have the information. Um, and you try to you remove that barrier of, I just don't know who to vote for. I don't know anything about these people. Um, I will also indicate, as Isaac indicated, there are 20 days left. We are in full GOTV. GOTV is get out the vote. Campaigns are in full get out the vote mode. They will, will be more than happy to accept any type of help and volunteer because most candidates um, on the local level do not have enough money and they would always be welcoming you to come um, and do the things of lit drop and, and phone baking and text messaging. Whatever you are able and ca capable of doing, there are campaigns who um, who want you. If you need more help about that, um, you can um, like reach out to me I'm on Instagram or Twitter at Stephanie House, and that's H-O-W-S-E, and I'll help you get connected um, to someone in your area. And that's even both Republicans and Democrats, even though I'm a Democrat, and of course I want you to vote for Democrats, but I can get you connected to the other side because I believe that all of us need to have our voices heard. Yeah, I am. Um, 
While Representative House was speaking, I thought of a few other things. I've seen people coordinate virtual uh, mailing parties where they have postcards that they mail to people who uh, might be leaning towards one candidate or another and encourage them to vote. But more importantly, and the thing that I see, especially in my intro to US politics classes, is that many young people don't understand how much politics affects their daily lives. And so I think we need to explain the why. We need to explain to them, for example, that their school receives federal and state funding or that they're only able to attend school because they've received a federal loan, for example. Also, traffic lights, bike lanes, sidewalks, uh, all these things that we take for granted, police services, fire services. If we can help them understand how politics influences their daily lives, then that might also be a ticket to getting them more engaged in politics. And just um, one more area where I think you can really compel people to understand how important these local races are. Um, in a recent episode I did for my podcast, I spoke with two activists from Chicago who are part of an organization called Chicago Votes. And they explained to me that there are a lot of people who walk around and are very upset with the police who are very upset with the prosecutors and with the judicial judicial system at large. And they don't realize though, that we actually get to put the prosecutors in many times uh, into office. We get to elect the DAs, we get to elect our judges. And so when there are judges that are handing out harsh sentences to young people, um, obviously we see across the country, but particularly in some big cities, we see that um, people of color are going to be given much harsher sentences. Uh, we can vote them out. We can fire those judges and we can fire those harsh prosecutors and elect more progressive prosecutors. So I just think that that's a way for me to really conceptualize like these local races are so important because they literally mean the difference between somebody who gets caught with uh, marijuana getting time in prison or getting a deferment program. And so mm -hmm. to me, I find that incredibly compelling because I have friends that have dealt with these issues and it's something that's really, really directly impactful, uh, particularly to a lot of young people. And so that kind of brings up the bigger topic of how we can actually prioritize political education for youth and ensure we have accurate knowledge about what's going on in the political sphere, especially in regards to, as you were saying, our general elections and, you know, what our judge, what our judges, local judges stand for. Um, if I could jump in real quick on that. So like, how is the question, Kennedy, kind of just like, how do you get educated about these races? Yeah. How can we, how can we ensure that we are getting educated about what's going on um, politically? And how do we make sure that we have accurate information as well? Yeah. So um, I have two things to say on that. The first is when you're looking at your local races, um, I actually find, and this is going to be such a geeky answer, I find that things like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are the best platforms to find out about your candidates. Because if we're talking about um, a local city council race in uh, not necessarily a big city like Cincinnati or Cleveland, but you know some of the suburbs, there's not really going to be a ton of news coverage for it. So looking up those individual candidates' Facebook pages and their Twitters, they'll be telling you what they stand for. So then you've got a direct from a source. So I highly recommend if you're looking at these races, just Google someone's name. And oftentimes you can find their information on social media. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention though, is that if you're looking to be more informed, oftentimes I think there exists, and again, I keep plugging my own show, which is not the only source of information. However, there are a lot of youth led forms of media that you can follow along that will teach you and kind of inform you and connect you with other youth involvement um, organizations. So for example, um, I know my podcast, The Youth Vote, it's entirely focused on highlighting people under the age of 30 that are doing remarkable things in politics. And so before this show, before doing research for the show, I did not know that there are hundreds of people in their 20s that are elected officials or activists that are making huge changes. Um, 
So I think finding some of these like youth run organizations is a really good way to get plugged in and kind of connect on a national scope with all of these other impressive young people. I, I like your point, Isaac, about when you first started talking about social media, I got a little bit scared, but I liked your point about going directly to the candidates' Twitter handles and to the uh, their Facebook pages to see what issues they're emphasizing and what they care about. Um, the reason I got a little bit nervous is that because the flip side of that is there's so much misinformation and disinformation spread on social media that this whole process is even more cumbersome and complicated by the fact that we don't necessarily what know what are good sources and not good sources because in my opinion we don't do a good job teaching media literacy in schools um, and so one of the resources i like is uh, vanessa otero's media bias chart which ranks news media outlets on a scale of um, on the y-axis, it's utter garbage conspiracy theories to high quality journalism with the higher ones being better. And then it's also ranked left to right with far left and far right and then in the center. And then in the center, for example, you'll see things like the Associated Press. Um, so I think paying attention to where you're getting information from can be important because you don't want to get caught in a filter bubble where you're just seeing information that you agree with. Uh, the other thing is there's really great websites like Ballotopedia that you can use to look up what races are on your ballot and then you can go to the links and learn more about each candidate and each race. Um, I think that the the digital environment provides information abundance, but we also have to know how to navigate that correctly. So I really like your idea of going directly to um, their Twitter handles or their Facebook pages, Instagram pages. I've also heard, maybe um, you guys might know more about this, there's been tons of GOTV activities on Snapchat, and that has been really effective at getting younger people engaged as well. And so I will also, uh, as we finish up, um, to say that a, a resource is your local board of elections. It has this thing called Track My Ballot. And it's, you can get a sample ballot. You do not have to. And I really strongly encourage people, do not wait till you go to vote to get a ballot. Like, seriously, you can go right now to your local county board of elections. There is a section that says, what's on my ballot? You could put your address in and then the ballot that you would actually see when you are prepared to vote. It'll say it'll have a little um, background that says sample ballot that will have all the information about all the people, at least to start with, that you'll be voting on. Um, and then you can utilize the resources, as Isaac indicated, uh, hear what people saying, you know, see if they've been in talks. You know, it's one thing for people to be in a debate format right which is a very time and they'll they have their talking points but i think it's very important to see um who people really are you know were they like quoted in news articles were they a part of some forums that you could catch a video because that shows you who people are you know what i'm saying you could only you could pretend a little bit on a on a debate <laughs> but people usually have a life before the brand and so I think that's valid. I also say, because I also believe that, like I said, voting is not an individual thing. This is a group and team effort. And for young people in particular, if you want people to recognize your voice, you need to flex your muscles. So, you know, it, it's, it is something if you have a group of 100 young people like, no, you know what, we want to hear about these city council, you know, put together some type of format. I know many of young people are very fluent in these online forums create a forum for these candidates to come and talk to you list out a couple of questions and you and hear directly from the source so you know this is the thing where i'm telling and really trying to push on people the power is in our hands yeah. you know it's not about other people it is about us we just don't flex our muscles enough and if young people want to have people in office that are going to do their bidding carry their water lift up their message and have the action to follow up you all are going to have to come together and force people 
force people to do what you want them to do. This is not a thing like, oh, they not talk. They're not gonna talk to you if you ain't showing up. You know what I'm saying? They're not gonna talk to you if you if you're not showing that we are a presence to be recognized. Like if y'all getting your parents to you know to be in alignment. So you know, understand the power is in your hands. You see what I'm saying? And utilize the resources. This isn't a bystander thing. This is everybody is on the court. Clock, the clock is ticking, and we're trying to get some points. <laughs> I love that message and what you're really driving home is the fact that if you don't show up, they're not going to pay attention to your policy priorities when they're in office. Um, but when you do show up, when you do make your voice heard, your issues or the ones you care about do make it onto the agenda. For example, right now we're seeing everyone's starting to take up student loan relief and that's because people have been speaking up. So. Uh, your voice can be very powerful. And uh, I think that's a great message. Thank you. There's so many great tips and resources and ideas there. Um, so now that we have reached mid forum, we're going to pass it over to Youth Forum Council Member Yash. Good afternoon. My name is Yash Kankaria and I'm a senior at Solon High School and a member of the Youth Forum Council. Today's Youth Forum is a unique discussion about youth involvement in politics mainly how to bridge the divide between the youth's political enthusiasm and their low voter turnout. Joining us today are Dr. Lauren Copeland, Associate Director of the Community Research Institute and Assistant Professor of Political Science at Baldwin Wallace University. Representative Stephen D. House, representative, the representative for Ohio's 11th District, and Isaac Mitchell, host of the Youth Vote podcast and local political campaign manager. If you have any questions for any of our panelists, Text them at 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them at City Club, City Club Youth. We'll work them in. May we have the first question, please? Yes. So our first audience question is, do you think that lowering the voting age to 16 will increase the turnout among youth? And how can groups like the Youth Advocacy and Leadership Coalition be effective advocates for this? So I will start off. Um, I do not think that lowering the age limit to 16 will increase um, younger voter turnout. Um, I think systematically, as I started or stated earlier, uh, I truly believe that we as a society have to do a better job of educating. Um, we do not educate um, our citizens about civics, our form of representative democracy. Usually what people get is a uh, uh, an overview of like three branches of government on the <laughs> level. But when we talk about teaching local local government, county government, which is a new form, you know, for those of us in Kyle County, then we're not teaching our citizens about that, then state government, and then of course, federal government. I think until we have a fundamental shift on how we are communicating the information and providing um, hands-on experiences for our citizens, um, our young people to engage in this democracy, I don't think we'll have more of a change in voter turnout if we change the vote I have mixed feelings about it. Um, on the one hand, I like the idea of expanding participation to 16 year olds, but when we expanded participation to 18 year olds uh, during the Vietnam War, then we saw a drop in our turnout rates among eligible voters because people who were much younger were less likely to turn out to vote. So I think that um, Representative House is on the mark in terms of the need to emphasize civic literacy in the education system and to have more forums like these and other ones that are accessible to youth to teach them about the political process and how to navigate it. I'll, I'll tackle the second part of the question. I agree. I don't know that we would necessarily have a large scale change in the voter turnout if we lower the voting age. Um, However, the second part of the question was kind of how can groups uh, advocate for this type of change? And I, I think that the way that groups could advocate for this kind of change is similar to how 
Um, the 19th Amendment came about and the 1965 Civil Rights, uh, or sorry, the 1965 Voting Rights Act came about, which is um, create a large scale organization across the country of people who are out there protesting and trying to create these changes locally. So for example, I know many, many states uh, gave suffrage to different groups before it became national policy. And so I don't actually know as somebody that's a 22 year old with no expertise in voting uh, policy. However, um, I would presume that there's a way that states can start to make these types of changes um, before we necessarily see a federal change. So I think get out and advocate for community level voting changes. And then once we kind of see the tides turning that way, then we might see those federal laws change. Um, I know both of the other panelists would be able to correct me if I was wrong there, but I think that that might be the strategically the way to go about things. Yeah, you bring up an important point about election policy and um, over at Baldwin Wallace, we just did a survey of likely voters in four different states, including Ohio, and there's widespread support for things like same day voter registration and uh, more drop boxes throughout the county where I'm in Cuyahoga. So I think in addition to educating people about what it means to be in politics and how politics influences you, we could also make it easier for people to participate. We don't do a good job of making it easy for people. The Thank one you. more thing I wanted to add though, is you, you mentioned uh, marches for the 19th Amendment and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Um, we tend to get down on youth when it comes to things like voting, but we do see youth being increasingly active in forms of civic engagement in their communities, in protests. And so I think there's just the need to say that everything, like all of that is great, but you also need to vote. So keep up the protest, keep up the work, keep up the activism and the volunteering, but you need to vote too. <laughs> Thank you. And on the topic of making sure that voting and having political impact is more accessible for people, we also have questions about how younger people can actually be involved in running for office. So you have an audience, that, an audience member that asked, I'll be turning 18 soon, but I want to run for office. How do I start? Um, this is my absolute favorite topic of all time. So if I could just have like a <laughs> minute to talk about this, um, whoever you are, the first thing I'll say is do it because just you running for office as a young person is going to inspire a lot of other young people to get involved. And um, you are going to perhaps win, which means then we'll have a young person in elected office and we need way, way more young people in elected office. But to actually answer your question, um, I think the first thing you need to do is come up with a plan. And that sounds so silly, but a lot of people say, I'm gonna run for city council and then that's it. They don't really know what to do next. So here are some of those little things you need to plan for. You need a plan for how are you gonna have a team? Cause running for office is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. So figure out, who can I have that's gonna help with social media, help with door to door? Um, I'm assuming as an 18 year old, you're probably not rolling around in money. Uh, I know most young people who run for office struggle to raise money. So think about, are there groups that could perhaps give me money? Could I go after some union endorsements? Are there friends or family members that I could get to chip in a couple bucks? And then the last thing I will say is know that you are going to have a lot of people who are gonna say, you are a kid, why should I vote for you? And my advice to you, having interviewed a ton of young people that have run for office and won and lost, is you confidently tell them why you can serve their interests, even though you're only 18, 19, or 20. Because there is no reason why your age should be a single factor to rule you out of office. And while some people are gonna use it against you, the ultimate strategy I could give you is don't hide your age, don't be embarrassed about your age, own it. And it's gonna actually inspire a lot of people to support you because you're a young person running. So that's like the biggest thing I could give you is all the successful young candidates I speak to are successful because they just own their age and they own who they are. They don't try to hide anything about their identity. 
Um, I would say for any person, um, and especially a young person, if you want to run, um, as Isaac say, run. Within that, though, I think it's very important to understand um, yeah. why you are running. Um, know the know the actual position, like what what you're running for and what their responsibilities are. You'll be so surprised of how people are running for office. And when they talk, I know they really don't know what they're running for because they're telling people stuff that they really can't do. So just be uh, be knowledgeable about the position that you are seeking. Um, I also think it is very important to understand the rules. When you are a candidate, no one cares about your age. You will get in trouble if you do not follow the rules. N understanding the uh, finance rules, ethics laws, as well as campaign uh, requirements. Those things are vitally important. And in order to get that information, there are a slew of training resources. Um, I will make sure I'll drop them in the chat um, so that uh, people can know some resources or where people can get training. Um, I think everybody should get some training. Um, and then also, um, if you're interested in, in, in running for a specific office, um, I think there's nothing wrong with having a conversation for somebody who's already in the seat, um, whether you are running against them or, 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 or running to replace them if it's an open seat. Have conversations with people who are in this office because many people, they've been there, they've done that. Um, they have some knowledge that they can share with you. And so um, it's also and that you might find out, you know, they might want to groom you or mentor you. So, you know, um, don't be shy. This is not the time to be shy. It's go out, seek information and do your best to put together a campaign plan that will lead you to be victorious. Um, and regardless of the outcome, whether you win or lose um, every loss is not a no forever. It can just mean not right now. But I will always encourage anybody to stay connected because you can lead with or without a title. Yeah, I like Representative Howe's point about having a message and having a why uh, you're running. Uh, you can't just say you want to be a city council person. You have to say why you could do a better job on city council than say another person. Of course, there's a lot of races that aren't contested and uh, those are prime opportunities too. And for women, young women who are interested in politics in particular, there are a lot of organizations that are devoted to getting more women in elected office. Uh, and I can post some links to those organizations in the comments. Um, the other thing is that people usually go into public service because they want to help people and pay it forward. And I've found that people, especially at the local level, are more than willing to take you on as a mentee if you're interested in running for office. So I would definitely encourage people to reach out for advice if you're interested in doing that. And one one final note on this for me is that uh, Representative House and Dr. Copeland both reminded me of this, is that there's a lot of kind of confusion and complicated systems that go into these elections. So for example, Representative House mentioned campaign finance laws. You really have to educate yourself on these things. But what I wanna say is don't feel like you have to do that alone. So I know for example, like I don't know if my email or Facebook or Twitter or whatever will be included on this, but like you could reach out to me and I would Zoom with you and talk about this. And I'm sure the same is true with Dr. Copeland and Representative House because when young people want to get involved in politics, we need to make it as accessible as possible. And so that's where like the offer is out for me. I'm sure there are many other people who would say, I'll sit down with you and walk you through, here are the steps you're gonna have to take because it is confusing, it is a lot, but um, I think that knowing there are mentors is really helpful. Thank you. And the panelists have been dropping some great resources in the chat. So we'll make sure to share that with all of our listeners. So on to our next audience question. How much could automatic voter registration impact elections? I found it difficult to learn how to register in general. So I will say um, 
automatic voter registration um, states that do have automatic voter registration, you show that it is an um, increase in voter participation. In order to get that, though, it's just like anything, you need to have people willing <laughs> to want that. Um, currently in Ohio, we have a state legislature um, made of people who do not want everyone to vote. And I'm going to flat out say that, and it has been demonstrated again and again by not putting into policies, enacting policies that will pass an automatic voter registration. Um, so I think it's vitally important. That's why we need to vote for people in office who believe in an open, um, you know, just in a fair process. Um, um, when we talk about having the information on how to register to vote, um, these are, I would say, prime opportunities for citizens to engage with your local um, um, board of elections, even the secretary of state to, uh, you know, put out different methods to get out the message, you know, because everybody is not a, a written, uh, looking at reading the rules, you know, we need to encourage more videos, we need to tell you, um, so people can demonstrate to see the steps on how to do it, because sometimes people learn by doing it. And so I think this is just vitally important of understanding. We need to get more people in the Ohio General Assembly and across this country that believe um, voting is essential and that everybody should have access to doing it and removing the barriers so that people aren't confused. Yeah, and um Representative Howes just reminded me of something that you could do and others could do, Kennedy, which is create a YouTube video that walks people through the process or do a Facebook uh, live session or go on Snapchat and post something walking people through the process. I think that could go a long way. Yeah, I don't have too much to add. I think that Representative House and Dr. Copeland really did a good job of explaining. I mean, this would be a great policy, but it's um, in Ohio right now. Uh, I know um, Representative House made a pretty strong statement of the Ohio House of Representatives right now doesn't really want people to vote. The GOP majority doesn't want people to vote. And as long as that's true, we're not gonna see these positive changes we need. So that's why, again, it's incredibly important to get out and support these state representative candidates and flip some of these districts and elect more uh, Democrats. Um, or if you're gonna support Republicans, at least make sure they're Republicans who want everyone to vote. Thank you. So our next audience question is, how does the gerrymandering problem in Ohio affect the U.S. elections? And how does this also influence the census? I'll, I'll take this on <laughs> since I teach it. Uh, so what gerrymandering has the effect of doing is creating safe districts in which if it's predominantly Republican, then a Democrat cannot compete successfully for office. And conversely, if it's gerrymandered for Democrats, then the Republican Party cannot compete on an even playing field with uh, the Democratic Party. And so in Ohio, um, the state has had control of drawing the boundaries and the result has been the creation of a legislature that is, and both representatives going to Congress, that is much more Republican than the demographics of the state of Ohio suggest it would be. So for example, you often see in presidential elections that we're a purple state, that we in Ohio split our votes 50-50 between the Democratic and the Republican Party, but you would never know that if you looked at the composition of the state legislature because the districts are gerrymandered in a way to make safe seats for the Republican Party. So when we talk about gerrymander, gerrymandering, um, as Dr. Uh, Copeland indicated, so I will be a, a part of the group uh, that will make the lines, um, mm -hmm. draw the lines um, for our federal candidates and our state candidates. Um, what does that actually mean in terms of number? Um, Dr. Copeland said, that you know we're kind of a 50-50 state, but when we look at our representation on the federal level, 
Um, we have uh, 16 congressional seats in Ohio. Um, currently, there are 12 Republicans and four Democrats. That's not 50-50. When we look at the Ohio Senate, there are 33 members of the Ohio Senate. There are 24 Republicans and nine Democrats, not 50-50. When you look at the Ohio House of Representatives, the body that I sit in, there are 99 members. Currently, we have 61 um, uh, Republicans and 38 Democrats, not 50-50. That is the result of gerrymandering, which is based on our census count, right? The census count will let us know how many people are in Ohio. So shameless plug, if you have not filled out your census, if your family hasn't filled out your census, please make sure you do because the Supreme Court just ruled that the Trump administration will stop it. And so it will end before October 31st. So if you have not been counted, please make sure you're counted. Um, but what that has resulted in is having policies in place that affect all of our lives that are not truly reflective of the beliefs and values of Ohio. So we need people to participate because it matters. And if you want automatic voter registration and a laundry list of the other policies, you have to have the people in the seats, not just saying, oh, I'm telling you what to do. If the people are in the seat that have that same belief, it's just a dream. It, you're just putting things out in the universe. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And um, so what, what they do, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say what they, what, what is done with gerrymandering is that they can uh, pack people into certain districts, say that are predominantly uh, democratic. You see this in Ohio for our federal districts where they've lumped together Cleveland and Akron. Uh, instead of creating districts that are separate. So all the urban voters that would tend to vote Democratic get only one seat instead of say two seats. Um, go ahead, Isaac. Yeah, uh, no, you're totally fine. I just wanted to add one thing um, and it's something I recently learned about called prison gerrymandering. And I wanted to talk about it a little bit because it's something that's being kind of newly explored in academia. And um, it was pr Professor Christina Rivers who teaches at DePaul in Chicago who taught me about this. So um, prison gerrymandering is something that happens where um, prisoners are currently disenfranchised in 48 states. So if you're in prison, you're not allowed to vote, which um, is a problem in and of itself, in my opinion. However, prison gerrymanders mean that if there's a prison that's housing thousands of people in a district, then that district actually can count those prisoners in their census as living in that district. However, those individuals then do not get to vote. And so when um, uh, when people are talking about making sure you fill out the census because you have to get those resources into your district, there are predominantly white districts in nice suburbs that have a prison in them. That prison is full of people who are not actually living in that district. They're not from that district. However, those names are being counted towards bringing more resources to the district and giving more voting power to those white people who live in that district, even though the prisoners themselves are not able to vote. So I know that was, I probably just made it more confusing than it needs to be. It's a really complex kind of newly researched issue. However, I wanted to point out that that is an issue that's currently existing and it's really, really problematic. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our last audience question, and that is, black women are known as a strong voting bloc, but as a young black woman, I'm finding it hard to get involved. I'm 17. How could I do that? Call me. Call me, text me. <laughs> I'm just I, I, because again, that's one of the things is I'll help you kind of navigate this process. Um, again, just reach out to me um, on Instagram or Twitter at uh, at Stephanie House. Um, and, and I will 